Archimedes looked up at the sky, you know. So we're not going to go quite that far that back, but I, I want to <laughs> talk about multi-threading before, um, before we go in and talk about like how to code it. Because it's important to understand like what it is that we're trying to do. All right. And this is a little confusing, and it's even more confusing um, by the fact that some people use different terms to mean the same thing, and some people actually use the same term to mean opposite things. Mul Pardon me? Like memory and hard drive? Uh, in a way, yeah. Uh, but multiprocessing, sometimes people say multiprocessing when they really mean multitasking. Um, but at any rate, in the beginning, not in ancient Greece, but I don't know where this would be, probably some lab somewhere, you would have a processor running a single program. That's probably like the simplest scenario that we could think of, right? One processor running one program. Now, I doubt that any of us have ever worked in that environment, myself included, all right? Because that presupposes that there's no operating system. Because an operating system would be a program or a set of programs. So what does an operating system do? Just Yeah, it's, it's, it's a program that sort of handles, um, um, your definition was good. Um, I might put a little bit different twist on it. You said it allows you to do other things. Yeah. Yeah. I would clarify the other things to say that a operating system um, controls the computer's resources. And that's a nice thing because... For example, you then don't have to worry about like low-level details, like how do you write to a disk? You simply tell the operating system, go and write to the disk, and it will go and do it for you. Yes? Uh huh? I don't even know how to begin to answer. I have no idea. No clue whatsoever. Um, it's like the old joke. What's what's the difference between ignorance and apathy? I don't know, and I don't care. So anyhow, so this is a very very basic. I mean, this is like theoretically the absolute simplest that you could have. All right. Now, the other thing you can do with a single processor is you can have multiple programs running on it. And this would be called multi-programming or multitasking. Programs themselves can be broken down into tasks and so on, so multitasking is probably the better word. But you could have multiple of these programs running. Still on one processor. And oh yeah, by the way, some of these programs might be operating system programs to sort of help the other programs do stuff. So that is probably, that's probably like where I jumped in the thing, you know, the, jumped in the scene, you know, where I would take my stack of cards and loaded in the card reader and the operating system controlled the card reader so when you press the button it read my deck in. It put my program into a queue with all the other students that were running programs and the CPU eventually got to it and processed it and sent the print output to the printer and sent a print job to the printer and it made sure that the print job didn't like mix up my output with someone else's, you know, so it like didn't print a line of my output and then a line of someone else's. It managed all that. So that's how the operating system came in. But with a single processor, a single processor could only be executing one instruction at a time. All right, by definition. 
and one instruction by a time. What is a program? It's a set of instructions. So when we say that a CPU is, or a processor, is executing one instruction at a time, by implication, it can only process one program at a time in this scenario. Program, or we could call them tasks. Now, how does that happen? Well, it happens that the computer can rapidly switch between the different tasks so that on human terms, it looks like it's doing three things at the same time. All right? So if you imagine back, you know, um, you know, uh, if you had a single processor machine, you could be surfing the web and running a word processing program and listening to some music. It looks like you're doing three things, but really, if you have one processor, it's only doing one thing at a time. But again, the, the, the computer's um, window of time is a lot smaller than your window of time. So it would switch rapidly between those. And those would be called something like time slices. Sometimes you devote a, simple, a little bit amount of time. Um, operating systems got very sophisticated to know that, like, for example, if program one was waiting for um, something to be written to the disk, um, it wouldn't give that program any more time until the output was finished to the disk or something like that. So that was part of the operating system's job, like to figure that out and to schedule it and make sure it optimized the use of um, the CPU's time. I mean, because if you look, even if you're not doing anything, if you look at the processes on your computer, you're doing a bunch of things. All right, and these are all parts of the operating system and services and all that that are running in the background. With a single processor, though, despite that, only one of, one of those things is going on at a time. All right? So that is multitasking, where you have multiple programs running at the same time. Only one of them is truly executed at any instant in time, but the processor's time is being split between them rapidly enough that it looks like it's doing everything all at the same time. All right. Now, now we get into true multiprocessing, where we have a second processor, or a third, or a fourth, or whatever. And again, you know, you wanna you wanna pull a bigger cart. What do you do? You either get a bigger horse, or you get two horses, right? Well, you want to do more on your computer at the same time. Either you get a more powerful processor or you get two processors, right? And again, this is one of those things that like kind of goes back and forth over time, you know? I mean, um, even like the whole notion of like distributed computing versus centralized computing, you know, it kind of goes back and forth in cycles and all that. But you can have multiple processing then, hey, you can have maybe more of these running at a time. Because each of these processors then can do things and can execute their own processes. So, one, proce one processor handling multiple programs is multi-programming or multitasking. More than one processors is multi-processing. Where does multi-threading come in? None of the above. <laughs> All right? Let's think of one of these programs being Java, all right? Is your program really executed by the computer in Java? And that's, that's kind of a tricky question, and I probably can't almost word it without giving away the answer. The answer is no. The Java virtual machine is running. That's a task that's running for your Java program, the Java virtual machine. Um, one of the beauties of Java is that you, should, you can supposedly write a piece of code one time and it will run everywhere. Any device that runs Java, you'll be able to run it. 
And part of that reason is that Java doesn't get compiled into the native machine code, but Java gets co compiled into, um, I forget what it's called, a byte code or something like that. So this Java virtual machine takes your program and executes it. So it uses your program as input. And it's, just, it's a Java virtual machine that's actually running your program. And the processor is running the Java virtual machine. So the Java virtual machine is one of many processes that's going back and forth on this computer. All right. Let's say you have something in your Java virtual machine that is going to take a long time. And when I say a long time, I mean a long time in computer terms. We're not talking about like a week. We're talking about fractions of a second still. All right. Specifically, if we're thinking in the world of Android, we're doing something like a database operation or we're running out to the web to get a piece of data or something along those lines. That's going to take long compared to normal operations. So, if my Java virtual machine has to run out and go and do something, and that's taking a long time, my UI, my user interface for my Java application may stop responding. All right, so I may touch something on the screen and nothing happens. All right, and that's not good. In fact, if uh, I, I forget the timing, but there's a certain duration of time that after you've touched the screen, if your program doesn't respond to it, Android will say, your program has stopped responding. Do you want to stop? Do you want to close it? All right, and you can say, yeah, I want to close it. No, I don't want to close it, all right? Um, I have a weaker processor in my phone now. I have a, 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 a replacement phone. Uh, 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 um, set my second string phone is, is now my starting phone. And uh, for things like Facebook, that's probably like a big app, a lot of times it will tell me it stopped responding. And it's probably not the Facebook app's fault. I guess it could be, but it's probably the fact that my processor just isn't fast enough to handle it. Okay, anyhow. So what can we do? What can we do? We can make sure that the time intensive processing doesn't hog up all of the Java virtual machines portion of time. Remember, the Java virtual machine gets its little share of time time slice or it's time share between all the processes that are running. If all of that time share would be devoted to running out to the web to pull some data or to do some database access on the phone or moving around characters in a game, all right, then the UI, me touching the screen and trying to do something with the screen, wouldn't be able to get any time. And as a result, the application would stop being responsive. Android's going to throw up an, uh, the, the thing uh, that it's, it's no longer responsive, and you could close it. So that's a bad situation. So what do we do? With Java, we have something called multi-threading. All right? And what multi-threading allows me to do is take my program and split it into two threads. And then, this is taking a portion of the time and splitting it and giving a little bit of the Java JVM's time to thread one, a little bit of the Java virtual machine's time to thread two. So that way neither of the two threads can monopolize the, t 
time allocated to my Java application. All right? And therefore, if I do something, if I'm doing something like running out to the web or doing a database operation, the UI thread can handle user input. Yes? Well, again, remember, remember, if we're talking about a single processor, only one thing's happening at the same time. All right? The difference is, is we give the illusion that it's going on at the same time because we're rapidly switching between them. All right? All we've done is we've bumped it down a level further still. In other words, forget about this level for now. How does a processor handle this? It switches between them. Does a little bit of this, 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 this, this. And it rotates among all the different processes or tasks that it's running. All right? All we've said with multi-threading is that when it comes to be the Java virtual machine's turn, that's executing our Android application, it's going to split its share of the time into two pieces and give a little bit of its time to this thread and a little bit of its time to that thread. So, you know, this gets, say, a third of the, you know, let's just oversimplify it. If this gets a third of the time, this gets a third of the time, this gets a third of the time, if we multi-thread it then, this would get half of its third, this would get half of its third. So we've just sort of bumped down that notion of doing two things, not literally simultaneously, but on human terms appearing to be simultaneously by rapidly switching between the two tasks and the fact that the scale of computer time is so much smaller compared to the scale of, of human time, it seems like it's happening at the same time. All right, so we just bump that down further. All right, so we haven't talked about this so far in class. All right, why not? Well, because everything we've done has been pretty simple. Nothing that we've done has been that risky of like hogging the CPU's time. All right, think of uh, what some of the applications we've done so far. We've done, um, you know, Blackjack. All right, blackjack, you, you take a hit, it gives you a card, does some calculations. That's not like going to run away with the CPU's time. That's going to happen pretty quickly. So you're not going to be locking up your application while it figures out whether you have 21 or 20. All right, or whether you're counting the ace as 11 or 1. All right, that, that's not going to, uh, that's not going to make the CPU sweat, that kind of calculation. However, now we're getting into database operations. And the same thing would apply if we were doing a network operation, if we were doing, pulling some data off from uh, the net. The same thing would apply if we were playing a game. For example, I was actually thinking about this on the way here. Um, think of Pac-Man, right? Pac-Man better be multi-threaded. Why is that? All the ghosts moving around? And, and Pac-Man moving around, right? If the ghost stopped whenever Pac-Man was moving, that kind of takes the fun out of the game now, doesn't it? Right? So that application better be multi-threaded. So whatever it's running on, there better be a little bit of time given to Pac-Man, a little bit of time given to the ghost, a little bit of time given to Pac-Man, and bounce between it so rapidly so it appears like Pac-Man and the ghosts are moving at the same time. When really, if there's one processor going on, only one of those things is happening at any given instant in time. All right? So, we have multi-threading to be able to handle two things that are running that I guess you could call independent, um, asynchronous. They don't have to be synchronized. All right? Um, in other words, in Blackjack, you couldn't go and calculate 
what the person's hand's value was until you've given that, that card to the person. That's a synchronous operation, right? I couldn't, I couldn't say, well, here, let's split off into two threads, and this thread is going to deal the card to the person, and this thread's going to do the calculation. All right? Because you have to make sure that the person got the card before you can go ahead and do the calculation. So that would be an example of a synchronous operation. That has to be synchronized. So that would need to be within a single thread. All right? Whereas Pac-Man, Pac-Man moving and the ghost moving, those don't have to be synchronized. Those can move relatively independently. You had a question? Okay. All right. So what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at asynchronous operations. Remember, there's like three things we're looking for, three or four things that we're looking for in the address book application. One of them was activities and launching activities. And we looked how we create intents and we can pass data from one activity to another using the extras. All right? And then when it returns, control goes back to the first activity that called it, and any sort of wrap-up can, can happen. All right. Let's look up. Let's review that for a second, then we'll get into the threading aspect of it. If I have to dash out of the room because I'm not feeling well, please someone tell me to take the microphone off so it is not recorded. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that out there. In my 216 class on Monday, I uh, accidentally went upstairs with the, uh, with the microphone on. Um, unfortunately, all I did was walk, walk upstairs, so that wasn't a problem, but... Today, I kind of want to make sure that I do not have a mic on. Where's my little adapter? For those of you who have me in a class tomorrow, um, just check Canvas, <laughs> just in case I continue to not feel well. Well, I mean... Yeah, I mean, still go. I mean, I'm planning on being there. Uh, if I don't feel worse than I do today, I'll be there. And my machine, I think, has a problem going to sleep and waking up, much like I do. Yeah. Um, this does this a lot, and it only happens since the operating system upgrade. Uh, I think before that. I think Yosemite. So Yosemite was the first time I started to start acting weird, although there could be some hardware problem that is failing us. I tend to think of this as like a new machine when it's not really that new, because this was NORAD's old laptop, and 
Um, this is like the third year NORAD's been gone. All right. So um, I've had it for, this is the start of the third year, and he had it for however long he had it, a couple years at least. Pardon me? Was there another NORAD? Well, right, but he, he, he's retired. He's, he's teaching as an adjunct. Well, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, he, he, uh, he retired from full-time teaching like two years ago. So, yeah, he, I mean, he still teaches. I think, he, I think he just teaches the advanced C class, advanced C sharp. But at, uh, previously, he taught the um, iPhone class. Oh, really? Oh, you might have, but I, I really doubt he would teach that as a retiree. If you do, well, except for the fact that sometimes people use different terminologies. Like again, multiprocessing versus multiprocessing. Did you? No, that would be separate processors. So that would be individual processors. Right. And again, I think we talked a little bit of time going back to that, that, you know, um, to truly get the advantage of the multi-core processors, the programs would need to be optimized for those. And it would need to, be, need to be in a position to take advantage of it. So like a single-threaded application, um, you know, only is running on one processor anyhow. So the fact that you have four of them, that'll help some because you have four horses now, all right? Um, but you won't be able to get the simultaneous parallel sort of processing of doing a bit of one on one processor, a bit on the other. I'll buy that. It's probably not real straightforward because you'd have to make sure that things could run independently and you have to make sure that something that was being manipulated in one thread um, wouldn't be affecting something that was going on in another thread. So I've not really done that kind of multiprocessing 
um, thing, but just thinking on a theoretical basis. It's probably not easy. I wouldn't think it would. Well, anything is easier to develop from the ground up than to take something that's written one way and, and, and force it into another context. I mean, that, that's like by definition, pretty much. Um, but again, um, I would say neither of them would be a walk in the park. Okay, to review quickly about um, activities, we have our address book. Oops. And we had where we were doing a certain activity. Here we're launching the add edit contact where all we do is we create the intent, say what we're going to call, and then start the activity. That's the simplest form, and that's the form that does not require passing any data from the one activity to the other. All right? So it's pretty simple and straightforward. Repeat that, please. Yeah, that, what that means is that's what starts it when you click the menu item. Um, now in the case of clicking on a contact in the contact list, we have to pass the ID of that contact all right, to the other activity. So we set up the activity and then we invoke that activity, but before we do it we put extra in there. And then when it's done, it reverts back to wherever this activity was. Finally, from view contact to edit contact, if we click the edit button, we pass a whole bunch of stuff over. We create our add edit intent. And we pass all the data over using the extras. And then this guy is able to pull off the values from the extras and use it to populate the text box. So that's how we do activities. Question? So what this is, is this is when I'm viewing a contact and I click edit contact. It goes and it grabs all the values from the different text boxes and puts it in the extras. Where do you see constants? Repeat that please. That's just a variable, yeah. That's just, that would be like your enumerator, kind of. It would be a way of saying that this is what I want to call this in every application. So uh, it, it's, it's a static um, variable. So that everyone knows that address book, that's the name I'm giving to the row ID. I could have done the same thing with these other ones, or they could have done the same thing with these other ones, yeah. So I, they could have said address book uh, dot name address book dot phone all right but they didn't not really sure why all right so let's look at let's go back to the very first activity the address book and let's open up text edit and I'm gonna run this 
just so that we have the emulator started in case we need that. getting errors on something. I do not feel like debugging this, so we'll just look at the code and we'll pretend we know how it works. Oh, I want to select all this. All right. So, this is a list activity. This is the very first activity that, that comes up, and it shows a list of all the contacts. All right. List activities give you a list view for free. You just have to set the adapter of the list, which is this contact adapter. That's how you populate, yeah, that, that's how you populate the view, right. And we can access the view by saying get list view. And we can set an on-click listener so that when they click on the list, it does something. What I want to look at, though, is right here. On resume, we have a new get contact task, execute, blah, 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 blah. All right? Get contact task is an inner class. It's sort of like a um, sort of like a listener, like a, like an event listener. All right. So it is specific to this, and it's another task within this activity. It's another task because it we're going to multi-thread this thing. All right. So we have another class and. Here, what we're doing here by saying get contact ta uh, new get contact task, we're creating the contact task, we're saying what to execute on it, and we're passing a, a null array of objects. Because we don't really need to pass anything to get a list. All right? This is what creates the other thread. This is what creates the other thread. All right. So when we do this, it's not like calling a function, right? If you call a function, if you have this and then you have this function and this function and this function, this line doesn't execute until that line is done. Right, because that's synchronous. Synchronous. In this case, this is asynchronous because we're starting an asynchronous task, which means that it doesn't sit and wait for this to finish. Therefore, this thread can still be responsive to the user touching the screen or or whatever. All right, because it's an asynchronous object. All right. Now, we create our database connector. All right. And we give it this object. This is the initialization part of it. Do in background 
is the code that's going to execute in its own thread. Actually, all of this executes in its own thread, but this part specifically is going to access in its own thread. And what does it do? We open the database connector and we return a list of all the contacts. All right. The data structure that we're returning from get all contacts is called a cursor. You can think of a cursor as a list that you can loop through and you can go to the next item on the list, previous item on the list, and so on. So effectively where it says get a cursor containing all contacts, or, or call contacts, I think it's supposed to say all contacts, what we're doing is we're getting a list of the contacts. Now, this background task, actually this might be the only piece that runs in its own thread. I'm a little confused. I believe that's the case. This is going to return this cursor. This method returns a cursor. And we'll look at the specifics of this in a little bit. But just know it returns a cursor, and a cursor is a list of things. What does it return it to? It returns it to this, on post execute. This is the stuff that runs after the, back, the background process is done running. So, this is what happens before the background task runs. This is the background task the part that runs in its own thread, and then this runs after the background process is done. This is within the inner class, right. So, while this is running, the other activities UI can handle interactions with the user. What funny syntax. Um, yeah, let's see. Object, object, cursor. Um, I would have to guess on that. I'm guessing that this identifies what is going to be passed in, what the background task is going to get, and then finally what's going to be returned. So post executes gets returned a cursor. And I'm thinking that these are like input parameters. But I'm going to verify that. It's things that get passed to and get returned from the other thread. Okay, so I was close. Three generic types. Params, this gets passed in. In this case, we're not really passing anything in, so I think we pass a null object in. Progress, in other words, if this was truly a long operation where it's downloading tons of stuff off of a server. 
we might want to display, we might want the main thread to display a progress and say that we are 50% done or of 5,000 things we've installed 200 of them or something like that. So this would be the object that the progress, and we don't override it, but we could do a on progress update. All right? And then this is the value that gets returned to the on post execute. So this is what gets sent to the progress update. This is what gets sent to the on pre-execute, I would guess. And then um, this is um, progress, and then this is the update. So that's what gets called on the post-execute. If we had an on progress update, this would define the type of data that is being sent back from it. All right. The three dots. Yeah, I, I, I see where that is. Um, I do not know what the three dots indicate on this. Yeah. Um, there's some good uh, documentation here that talks about this. Th those are, I lost track of what the first or second or, all right. Doing background, this parameter matches this. My guess would be that the three dots indicate that you could actually send more than one object to it. That would be my guess, but I have to say I don't know. So this matches up with the do in background. So if I called this and sent it an object, that's how it would get passed to this. This would be the object I would use to um, display progress. So for example, my do background process thread can call a publish process method to set values in this object. And then we could have in the main thread an on progress update that would display the, the, the update of it. And then finally, this corresponds to what this method returns to this method, the post-execute, which indicates what happens when it's done. Let's look at another, pardon me? Let's look at another one where we're viewing the contact. And let's look at the asynchronous thread, because all of these are going to have asynchronous threads.
Here, for example, is the delete one. The delete asynchronous task. Yeah. We create an asynchronous task for when that guy gets clicked. We pass it along. In this case, the long is what? The long is going to be the ID that we want to delete. All right. Do in background, and we're calling that long. Actually, param zero indicates that that is meant to be a list. I don't know why they don't represent that as an array, but the three dots indicates that there could be a list of these things. That's why param zero is used. You're pulling the first um, long that is passed. But we're calling the delete contact and we're giving it that parameter and we're returning nothing. All right. So there's no progress and no wrap up. So we don't on post um, execute, we don't get back anything. We simply finish this and return back to the, uh, we, we finish this um, activity and return back to the main list activity. So this is meant to pass, the, how we're passing data to the asynchronous task, the updates, how that's going to be exchanged, and then finally the finishing, what we're going to do with the results. Let's look where we are editing. Or no, when we are retrieving the data. All right. Again, what are we giving to our background task? We're giving it along. What are we giving to the project? Just a, or I'm sorry, the progress, just a generic object. All right. In other words, we're not really updating the progress because these aren't going to take that long. Then finally, what are we getting back from the asynchronous task? We're getting back a cursor. So in this case, we're pulling up a single contact. So therefore, we pass that long, we go and get the one contact, and we pass in the parameter that's the primary key of that contact. We get back a cursor. A cursor, again, is a list, the result of a query. In this case, our list is only going to have one item. So we go to that item, we get back our cursor, we go to that item, and we pull the first item from the list and set the different text boxes with that. So the key things in these async tasks are the task is defined, it's set up. There is a method that says what is going to be done in the separate thread that's called do in background, and you can pass stuff to it. And then there is something that you're going to do when the background task finish, finishes executing. And that is the on post execute. questions over any of this? I know, this is very confusing. Yeah. Let me try to isolate the important things. First important thing to understand is the rationale why we are doing this. We are doing this because the database operation is an operation that runs the risk of taking a long time in computer terms. So therefore, we want to put it in its own thread so that the UI can proceed without getting hung up by the database operation. So that, first of all, is the rationale. I mean, it's important to know why we're doing this, right? I mean, you can know the syntax of it, but if you don't understand why you're doing it, it's not going to do you any good. So first thing is the rationale. 
Second thing, what's the mechanism for doing it? The mechanism for doing it is an asynchronous task. All right? So everywhere where we are doing a database operation, let's view this one again. Here I'm getting a list of contacts. There is an asynchronous task to do that. And this is how I invoke the asynchronous task. I'm giving it, saying what? Asynchronous task I want. I want to create a new one of these. Get contact task. And I want to execute it. And I want to pass it some objects. The objects I want to pass it are null. So I, I have the ability to pass it something. But in this particular case, I don't need to pass anything. Why not? Because to pull up a list, I'm just pulling up a list. I don't need to specify, like, which contact I want. I, I'm pulling up all of them. So, when that execute happens, what happens? Well, first, this initialization happens. All right. We could have some code that we do before we do the background process, but in this case, we don't. We pass to the do in background method any of the objects that were passed into this. And then we write our code that's going to run in a separate thread. So we're overriding two methods here do in background and on post execute. Do in background is going to be the thing that needs to be in its own thread. In other words, it's the thing that's at the risk of taking too long. In this case, the database query. On post execute is what runs when that background process is done. Remember, these are asynchronous. That means that they don't have to happen at the same time. All right. However, we sort of have to sync things up. In other words, when this thread that we branch off finishes executing, we have to communicate the results back to the main thread. And that's what we do on the on post execute. We set the list of the, um, we, we set the adapter of the list for this activity to the result. And then we close our database connection. So do in background and on post execute are the two really relevant things here. The do in background is the code that's at risk of taking a long time. The on post execute is sort of our wrap up code. Okay, our asynchronous task is finished. Let's wrap things up. Between now and Thursday, take a look through this. Um, also, again, the Android developer has good documentation on what happens in an asynchronous task and all that. You can take a look at that. Try to look through one of the other asynchronous tasks. In other words, here we're looking at the one that is in the address book activity. Look through the one that is in Add Edit. We have an on-click listener that is 
looks to see if the save button was clicked and when it was clicked, if it was clicked, it creates a new asynchronous task whose job is to save the contact. So I call save the contact. When I am done, I simply finish the activity and go back to the main activity. So go through the other two classes, the add edit contact and the view contact, and see if you can make sense of the asynchronous activities. And we'll go over those next time. What I plan on doing next time is to spend a little bit of time reviewing activities, asynchronous tasks, and then finally get into the database operations, which actually, believe it or not, is probably the simplest part of this. All right? Uh, and to look at the menus. The menus are pretty straightforward as well. So that's what we will do next time. All right. You are going to create a database for your one assignment. And we'll also remind me, we'll, we'll talk about the uh, assignment for this. Because it might not be as intimidating as you think it is. All right. Because between you, me, and the lamppost, you're really just tweaking this application to do something and putting your own stuff in it. So um, you can use this sample application as a template and uh, just change it to work for your particular database that you're storing. All right. Okay. We'll see you Thursday. <laughs>